This is the Volkswagen Phaeton. <sighs> Can't do it. Hey guys, what's up? It's Todd. I have a brand new car to show you. Here it is. It's a 2004 Volkswagen Phaeton and... <sighs> So yes, this is a 2004 Volkswagen Phaeton. It is actually my 2004 Volkswagen Phaeton. On our podcast, The Car Debate, I've been bringing up cheap Volkswagen Phaetons since 2014 and have always thought it would be a riot to have one. Now Paul, my co-host, and I have both bought ridiculous old massively depreciated luxury sedans. He got a Maserati Quattroporte for just under $11,000. I got this 2004 Volkswagen Phaeton with 131,000 miles on it for five grand. First place I want to start is actually the name. There's a lot of discussion about how to pronounce this word. It does come from Greek mythology. It does have a lot of history. However, Volkswagen in their own material, both for consumers and more importantly for their private internal stuff for salespeople and for techs. They show the pronunciation they want for this car. F-A-Y-T-O-N. Phaeton. The strange and ridiculous thing about these cars is this was Ferdinand Peake's last great idea, if you will. I mean, this is the guy behind the Porsche 917 all the way up through the Bugatti Veyron. Around the time that he was pushing Volkswagen to make the Bugatti Veyron, he also said, let's make the world's greatest sedan. The crazy part about the world's greatest sedan was let's make it a Volkswagen. That doesn't seem like what you'd have for the people's car, but let's go with the guy. He's had some crazy good ideas. The story goes that when he first commissioned this car, he gave the engineers 10 variables this car simply had to achieve, all of which were near impossible. 15, 20 years later, that full list still isn't published anywhere that I can find. The one that is generally talked about is that it had to maintain 72 degrees inside the cabin while it drove 186 miles per hour on the Autobahn all day at a temperature of like 100 degrees. Why that matters and is an important variable, I don't know, but that just gives you a glimpse at the madness that was behind what was required for this car. And then let's sell it for $100,000 and then let's sell it as a Volkswagen. Genuinely the biggest struggle for this car in the US, it was only sold for two or three years and it was a sales disaster, mainly because people don't shop Volkswagen for their flashy luxury sedan. People that are gonna generally buy a big executive cruiser car don't want subtle and they do care about the badge. You throw Volkswagen at that and it's simply not good enough. But the really cool thing about this car is it was being built alongside the Bentley Continental of the same era. In fact, the Bentley Continental GT, the big four-door quarter million dollar super sedan that Bentley made, that is the sister car to the Phaeton. In a very real way, when you bought a Phaeton, you were buying a Bentley Continental GT for less than half price. I bought this car from Florida, $5,000. It had neither of the known regular issues on this car, which are apparently coolant leaks from the center of the engine block, that's fun to fix, and the front suspension failing. It came off the truck, it was about 50 degrees in Park City, and I drove it for a week at 50, 60 degrees before the winter really set in. Then I put it in for winter tires, went out of town, came back, it was 20 degrees outside, and the suspension decided, you know what, I'm a Florida car, I give up. That was instantly a $2,000 job to get the front from sitting down on the bump stops and being essentially undrivable. The problem with a $5,000 car in general, whatever you buy, forget Phaetons for a minute, is that it will need something. It's being sold for $5,000, which means it's high miles, there's lots of wear, it probably has problems you don't even know about. The problem with this car, though, is because it is a $5,000 version of what was nearly a $100,000 automobile, when you have to fix stuff, the parts and then the labor to actually do things is far more than it would be if you bought a $5,000 Civic, or in my case, a Mini. This is a massive car. It's probably even bigger than you think it is. And the fact that it looks, let's be honest, like a Jetta means it has in your subconscious kind of an awareness of how big it is. And it's nearly twice that size. I do love it in black. It has a nice, subtle, executive look about it. Now, the chrome wheels are questionable. That looks a bit gangster for me, but I am the OG, so I guess that works. This is a base Phaeton, which actually means it does not have individual climate controls in the back. It has the simple center console in the back. It also doesn't have the fully adjustable with massage rear seats. It does have, 2004 remember, heated and cooled front seats, and they've done it with a single knob. If you go into the positive, guess what's that heated seats? If you go into the negative, that's cooled seats. 
Yes, they still work, and they work well. I'm the third owner of this Phaeton. Whoever originally bought this car clearly specced it as a driver because they did pay extra for the 18-way front seats. These actually twist about every way you can possibly imagine, of course, with my weird long torso. I'm still a little closer to the sunroof here than I would like. Think about 2004. That's pre-smartphone. In fact, this car comes out three years before the iPhone does. This was a technological marvel in 2004. Now, unlike today when everything is on a touchscreen, this has a screen, but everything is buttons. As a result, almost everything in this car, in classic German fashion, has a dedicated button to do what you would like. The other thing here is that everything is more complicated than it needs to be. The level of redundancy in this car honestly rivals most space programs. Two batteries in the trunk. The one on the right side actually starts the ignition. The one on the left side runs all of the electronics involved in here. If you have a problem with the starter battery, you can tell the left side electronics battery to help it start the car. In a similar way, there are two fuel pumps. There's a primary fuel pump and a secondary fuel pump. The problem with everything being redundant is that that means there's twice as much stuff that can and will break. This car was designed with what they called a draftless HVAC system. They are attempting for you to never feel air blowing past you. Now, you can control whether or not these, look, I'll show you. This nice wood panel slides up, leaves the clock revealed, and actually has normal vents that will blow on you now. You can control how much those vents are open. These are sliders here that you can actually turn the vent off. Why you can't just reach up and spin a knob like normal cars is because, let's be honest, it's the Phaeton. In the center of the console here, right under the clock, there is yet another temperature control. That is the temperature control just in case you would like the center vents to be blowing a slightly different temperature than what is happening at your feet. Now, of course, I've gone into manual and I turn this on. If I turn it off, it will close those vents down again and it will go back to its full default setting, which is draftless, so you have no idea. You can crank the heat up on this and you're aware of the fact that the, all the heat is kind of emanating from your footwell, but you don't feel it anywhere. Even on your ankles, you don't feel anything blowing. This center screen is the brain of the entire car, and it was terrifying to techs when it first came out, and in some cases still is. Luckily, your typical down-the-street tech, my personal mechanic, can hook up to this car, talk to the computer, and tell it what's going on. Remember, this car came out before YouTube was a thing, before the smartphone was a thing, even about a year after the iPod. A lot of the tech pioneered in here, wound its way into other cars, more specifically the Cayenne. My wife has a 2010 Cayenne, and the actual lights that are used here for the corner sensors are the exact same. The mechanism that is automatic, that has, actually is a button on your seat to raise and lower your seat belt attachment point, that found its way into the Cayenne. A lot of this stuff, you do see the parts sharing elsewhere in Volkswagen. This is every bit as lengthy as any big executive sedan you can think of. Most big SUVs, this is bumper to bumper about as long as those are. All of that room plays out in the front seats, of course, but in the back seats, you're simply luxuriating. It's because of that size that I find myself regularly surprised by how capable this car is. It has far more power than I would expect to when I look at the weight versus the actual power. This weighs a thousand pounds more than the A8 from the same era. A thousand pounds because where they used aluminum on the Audi, they went, no, no, steel for the Phaeton. This is the same 4.2 liter V8 you got in the Audi S4 of the early 2000s. So we're dealing with about 330 horsepower, about 320 pound-feet of torque, which is decent until you realize this is a 5,200 pound car. That doesn't seem like it'll be nearly enough power to move this car, but yet when you get it on an open freeway here and you actually have to accelerate, it's a train. It may not jump off the line, but it steadily builds in a way that just feels unstoppable. And once you get up to major freeway speeds, it just feels like it's gonna do that indefinitely. You can, of course, get the crazy W12 engine in this, and of course, those cars are lots more expensive than $5,000. Also, you add a big extra questionable variable to the ownership of this car. There were enough questionable variables with all of the electronics and things that are known to go wrong on these. I just thought, you know, let's just get the V8 and be happy. The W12 on this car has more than 100 more horsepower. That would be nice, but honestly, I expected to get in and be disappointed, and I'm frankly not. The sport programming on this transmission actually makes it downshift quickly and find power readily. 
When they released the Phaeton, this was actually Volkswagen's first ever six-speed transmission. I'm going to go into the suspension because, of course, everything is controlled by this screen. I'll turn the knob all the way to sport, which stiffens that air suspension a little bit. This is still a massive car. It is not a corner carver. I'm also on winter tires. I'm not expecting anything grandiose here, but I have to be honest, once you put it into sport mode, it leans far less than I would expect, especially because you're coming out of comfort where it leans a whole lot. The first time I ever drove a Phaeton is when this one got pulled off the truck and was already mine. I'd never driven one before, and Paul was pretty convinced that since I'm a guy that likes small, involving cars, I was going to hate this. I have to tell you, one of the things we talk about all the time is getting new life experience. I like this because it is so different than everything else I have in my life. Of course, it has zero, I mean no steering feel at all. This is an unbelievably light steering rack for pretty much the heaviest car being sold. There's no steering feel whatsoever, but at the same time, I don't really care. That, that's not the reason that this car is designed. It's designed to saw up miles and to be a nice executive cruiser. It does that phenomenally well. In fact, better than I thought it would, especially for a 15-year-old car. All right. Huh. That's, uh, that's an Autobahn speed in a 15-year-old Volkswagen Phaeton with the base motor. And planted, powerful ready to saw across the country. This 15-year-old $5,000 luxury car is still ready for all of that. Okay, I paid $5,000 for it, so let's do the $5,000 car review, shall we? What's wrong with it? Here at the steering wheel, it's all mechanical. It will still go in and out. It will not go up and down. The problem with that is I actually can't see the tops of the gauges. I'd like this wheel to be about a half inch higher. Once I get above about 50 miles an hour, I have no idea where the needle actually is pointing. So 50 to 100, I'm just blind. So I just drive a speed that feels comfortable. If I look around the wheel, I realize most of the time that's 85 to 90. That's how stable this thing is at speed. Other things that are broken, well, the gas gauge comes to mind. I actually ran this car out of gas and it actually died in my driveway when I still had just under a quarter tank of gas. When I filled it up, it said it only had three quarter and I put almost 24 gallons in it. That rear window is delinquent. The trunk ponders a long time before it opens. I'm missing a couple of little trim pieces on the front. One of the corner markers is gone. I have a crack in one of the rear tail lights. Okay, all right. This car spec like this would have been about $75,000, $80,000 when it was new in 2004. You convert that to today's money, that is still an over $100,000 Volkswagen. Most people are never even going to consider that. What's crazy about the fact that it was a sales disaster is they have dropped even more than other cars from their era. Paul bought that Maserati Quattroporte for $10,900 and that was an amazing deal. We got these cars as a laugh and also as a discussion point. There was actually a GoFundMe. Many of you helped us partially get into these cars. The intention is to drive them for the next year and actually talk about should you be this nuts? Should you actually buy a wickedly depreciated former expensive luxury sedan and drive it as a daily? Now, I am not going to count against it for the fact that I bought it for $5,000 and instantly put money into it. That is honestly most $5,000 cars. The painful part is how much that costs when you have to put that money in. We're gonna keep a running tally of everything spent on these cars. We're gonna have regular updates on them so that you know how they're doing. I'm hoping, now that I decided to completely replace the front suspension, that it just runs. Now, there are, in many ways, cheaper ways to do everything. You can put Audi parts on this and get rid of the air suspension. You can actually buy refurbished air suspension struts and put those in. I went ahead with new parts and just thought, let's give this car the benefit of the doubt and give it the actual way it was supposed to be. In a perfect world, I would have spent more money and replaced the rear shocks, but let's at least wait till they break, shall we? Folks, I am following a Pontiac Aztec in the wild, right there. You want to know where they all went? They came to Utah to die, and they still haven't died. But there he is, Pontiac Aztec. When it turns to wintertime in Park City, Salt Lake, they appear, and there one is. That's actually a, a contemporary of this car. I, I did better. You could get one of those for $5,000. Rather be here. Here at Everyday Driver, we're one of the longest running car shows on the web. We are. If you've been watching us since 2007, or you just discovered us last week, we are an independent channel and still producing original content. 
Our TV show airs on the Motor Trend Network, but if you don't have cable, all the episodes can be streamed on Amazon Prime. We host a top 10 automotive podcast called The Car Debate with about 400 episodes and new ones airing every Tuesday and Friday. So if you've got a question or need a car, our podcast can help you. Here on YouTube, the Fast Blasts are still here. They're going to become a little simpler, more like a video podcast, actually, mixed with a new car review. We'll still make well-produced single-car reviews of enthusiast cars, plus we're adding champs doing classics, mate doing motorcycles, and we're even doing the occasional mountain bike review. And if that's not enough, we do have five feature films, including one-of-a-kind generational comparisons of the Corvette, the 911, and the M3. Plus we host meetups, track days, and even a trip to the ring and spa. We do all of that, so thanks for watching, listening, sharing, there's lots more to come.